Hey, Dr. Hoover, I think I'm going to, I think we might have arrived at the hour here. Um, oh, okay. Uh, if you care to, to dive in, I might. Sure, I'll quit bugging you about your garden, sir. <laughs> no, no, we can chat more <laughs> later. I know. There's other, yeah, other fish to fry, so to speak. <laughs> well, Clean ones, right. I hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that's very topical. Well, so for those uh, those just joining us, um, everyone is currently muted to reduce background noise, um, except for myself and Dr. Hoover. So. Good morning and uh, welcome to our Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment teleconference. Um, this is entitled, From the St. Lawrence River to St. Lawrence Island, the role of community-engaged research in achieving environmental health and justice. With joining us is Associate Professor at Brown University, Dr. Elizabeth Hoover. Hello, thank you all for having me. Um, so yeah. they, they've asked me to come and visit with you all today to talk a little bit about the, the book I wrote about some of the work that people in Akwazasne have been doing for the last several decades in trying to address some of the environmental health threats there as a result of local industries. Um, so for those of you who might have access to... I'm going to jump to, in. Sorry, sorry okay. Mr. Hoover. I'm, I'm just going to give a slightly, uh, a slightly a little more detailed introduction. I think I think I, I think okay. the way you dive in. But, uh, <laughs> even just to, to introduce myself, my name is Nick Reardon. Um, and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, uh, I'll be facilitating the, today's call. And uh, it may be old news to some of you, but uh, CHE Alaska is a regional partnership group of the National Collaborative on Health and the Environment. And uh, CHE Alaska's aims are to advance knowledge and effective action to address growing concerns about the links between human health and environmental factors. You can find more information at akaction.org and healthandenvironment.org. Um, and so this morning, I sent a link to our presenter's slides to everyone who had signed up for the call. And if you signed up more recently or still need to access that presentation, you can find the PDF or a link to that uh, by going to akaction.org and clicking on the title of today's call. Um, keep in mind, this is audio only, so it's not a webinar. You'll need to click through the document yourself to follow along. And our call will last one hour, uh, beginning with a presentation. And then we'll have questions during the last 10 to 15 minutes or so. So jot down notes and be patient. Um, <laughs> so with that, it is my honor to formally introduce and welcome our speaker for today, Dr. <laughs> Elizabeth Hooper. She is an Associate Professor of American Studies at Brown University, where she teaches about environmental health and justice in Native communities, indigenous food movements, and community-engaged research. Her first book, The River is in Us, Fighting Toxics in a Mohawk Community, delves into the effects of Superfund contamination in Agwesusne along the St. Lawrence River, as well as the environmental health research projects undertaken by the community to try and protect their health and preserve their culture. I can't really recommend this book enough. Um, Dr. Hoover has also co-edited a book entitled Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the United States, Restoring Cultural Knowledge, Protecting Environments, and Regaining Health. And she has an upcoming book, from Garden Warriors to Good Seeds, Indigenizing the Local Food Movement. And there'll be link to, links to these on our website as well as in a follow-up email. Um, so as you can glean from these titles, Dr. Hoover has a knack and presumably a passion for articulating connections <laughs> between food, culture, and environmental health and justice. Um, alas, we can't talk all week, so uh, we've invited Dr. Hoover <laughs> to share her thoughts on the role of community-engaged research in achieving environmental health and justice, and uh, join us in a discussion for some parallels with contamination and community health research projects underway uh, here in Alaska on St. Lawrence Island. Um, so with that, Dr. Hoover, welcome, and uh, take all it right. away. Well, thank you for the great and very thorough introduction. I was just ready to just jump right in here, but that's good that now everybody has a little background. Um, and I'm coming to you today from Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. So I was just telling Nick it's great to be able to, to join you all from the other side of the country in such an easy way. Um, so to get started here, um, in thinking about the, the space we're going to be talking about today, the second slide in the, the PDF is a, a map of Akwesasne. So for those of you who are calling in 
who don't have the visual in front of you right now. Um, this is a, a Mohawk community that shares a border with the state of New York, with the province, province of Quebec, and the province of Ontario. So it is bisected by the um, international border between the U.S. and Canada that is set at the 45th parallel during the Treaty of Paris in 1793, which was very inconvenient for the folks living there. So now people who are living in Akwesasne have to deal with the U.S. federal government, the Canadian government, federal government, um, with the state of New York, with the province of Ontario and the province of Quebec. And there are um, at least three tribal governments here as well. So on the southern half of the community, you have the St. Regis Mohawk tribe, that is a federally recognized tribe that's recognized by the, the U.S. government. On the northern half, you have the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne, which is the, the band council government recognized by the Canadian federal government. And then you have the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs, which is comprised of hereditary chiefs and faith keepers and clan mothers who help um, designate those offices. So it's a politically complicated place, a jurisdictionally complicated place, and it's bisected by the St. Lawrence River. So this is interesting how we have the, the St. Lawrence connection here between the East Coast and the, the West Coast out in Alaska. So the St. Lawrence River um, cuts right through the community. And in 1954, they turned the river into the St. Lawrence Seaway with the idea of being able to um, bring ships from the Atlantic Ocean up through to the Great Lakes. And as part of this project, so they dredged out the river and made it so the ships could come through, but they also set up power dams in order to provide hydroelectric power as a way of trying to boost the economy of the area. And this brought industry to come utilize this hydroelectric power, many of which set themselves up directly upstream, upwind, upgradient from Akwesasne. So you had the General Motors plant, which is that little red circle that's directly adjacent to the Racket Point portion of the community. Um, just upstream from them, you have Reynolds Metals, which is an aluminum foundry. Um, upstream from them, you have what used to, which is now called Alcoa um, East, and then upstream from them is Alcoa Aluminum, which is now called Alcoa West. And then it used to be across the river in Ontario, there was the Dom Tar paper mill, which is no longer there, but they're still dealing with the historic legacy of the mercury contamination that was a, a paper mill there. So um, people were concerned in the 1970s, Cornwall Island, that purple portion of the map there. Um, if you scroll to the, the next picture, you can see how close the industries were. So the, the main picture is a photo from my friend Gina's front yard, which shows General Motors just across the river, um, just a stone's throw from her house. Reynolds Metals there, which was a little bit upstream, in the 1970s was emitting a lot of fluoride. Um, the amount they were emitting turned out to be legal under state standards, um, but when you come up with numbers in a lab for how much things should be admitted, um, oftentimes they weren't taking into consideration that the cows, for example, living on Cornwall Island would be eating fluoride on the grass that had settled there, drinking it in the water, breathing it in the air. And so throughout the 70s, the cows started dying. Of, they were falling down, their legs were breaking, they were dying in childbirth, their teeth were breaking. And a vet came up from Cornell University in 1979 and determined that they were dying from fluoridosis, um, too much fluoride. And so then there was an effort to put some scrubbers on the smokestacks in this factory. But there was also an interest in so are these industries starting to impact humans? So the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in 1980 sent up some folks. They took some fat biopsies. You know, they ran around taking lots of different samples. And then they kind of disappeared from the community. There were some results published in 1984. They said things were kind of inconclusive. And the community wasn't really very happy with, okay, we gave our time. We gave our biological samples and didn't really get anything out of it. Um, if you scroll down to the, the next photo, you can see an aerial view of um, just how close General Motors and Reynolds directly upstream are to Akwesasne. Now, in 1981, um, they discovered two dormant sludge pits filled with PCB-contaminated waste right behind that General Motors plant, so right um, alongside the river. Even though PCBs were banned in 1978, prior to that, they had been used in hydraulic fluids throughout the, the factory. And then what they would do is when they would flush the fluids out of the factory, um, the liquid waste would go into these wastewater settling lagoons, 
that were right on the shore of the river. I mean, I really think it's not a good idea to store your liquid waste on the shore of a river. They overflowed pretty frequently into the St. Lawrence River, the Racket River, and Turtle Creek, all in that area. And also, um, the sludge would then be dug up from those lagoons and put in the landfill, which is that big kind of kidney bean-shaped um, object in the corner of the General Motors site. And because it was unlined, um, the PCBs leached out through the bottom of the landfill and contaminated the groundwater. So in 1983, it was determined the General Motors had polluted the river, the land, and the groundwater with PCBs, and the whole 270-acre site was put on the national priority list as a Superfund site in 1984. So it was really one of the, um, the first Superfund sites to be identified and labeled. So the next slide down, just to give you a little rundown of PCBs, I'm sure up in Alaska you are all quite familiar with them there, especially on St. Lawrence Island, if anybody's in that area. Um, so PCBs aren't just one kind of chemical, there's 209 different congeners that comprise this category of chemicals. They were manufactured in particular mixtures, so the one particular to what General Motors was using was Araclar 1248, meaning it was 48% chlorine. And so Later, when they were, were doing these tests and trying to determine you know, where the PCBs in the fish and the breast milk came from, they were able to clearly identify it to the mixture used by General Motors and not other industries upstream or the, the power dam upstream. And the reason why people were nervous to discover that they had PCBs in their breast milk and blood and fish and environment is that some of the possible health effects from exposure to PCBs are cancer, endocrine disruption, immune suppression, neurobehavioral abnormalities, um, and this is why they were banned for use in 1978. The other thing is they bioaccumulate and biomagnify. So again, even though they've been banned for as long as I've been alive, um, they're still circulating around our environment um, and getting into people's fat and being passed along through the food chain. And it's interesting the way we think about um, you know, PCBs migrating and volatizing and doing these very animate activities. And so Mel Chen is a scholar who has written a book called Animacies um, in thinking about the way they lend mobility and agency to these sorts of things um, in the way sometimes I think absolving some of the humans that have left these messes and helped them to move around. So the, the next slide, um, basically after it came out that these PCBs had leached into the environment. There was a Mohawk midwife named Gudji Cook who became concerned. She had been taking some classes at Cornell. She had read some papers about um, beagles that had been exposed to PCBs and the types of birth abnormalities they were having. And as a midwife, she had been working to get women back into breastfeeding. So the previous generation had been told, oh, formula is best. And now her generation was trying to get women to breastfeed, and she was concerned about whether she should be doing that if there were PCBs in the environment. So she went down to um, Albany, the capital of New York State, and met with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation wildlife epidemiologist named Ward Stone. And she said, look, I need you to come up and test the fish here and tell us if our food is safe. And um, in 1985, he did that, and he started immediately announcing his results, which is not how the state was used to doing things, and they were not happy with that. But basically, the, the standards at the time were don't eat anything above two parts per million, and anything above 50 parts per million was considered toxic waste. And what he was finding was, you know, 190 parts per million in a duck, you know, 11 parts per million in one sturgeon, 30 in another. Um, and then 3,000 parts per million in a snapping turtle. So this poor snapping turtle had been walking around as toxic waste. And people were especially upset about that because of the role turtles play in the Mohawk creation story and also the turtle clan. So turtles are seen as an important animal. And here this poor turtle was walking around in toxic waste state. So after the, it was discovered that, yes, there are PCBs in the fish, her concern became, okay, are there PCBs in the breast milk? And so this is where really she helped to kick off the first large-scale community-based participatory research project um, in the whole nation with a native community. So they went over to the New York State Department of Health first and said, you know, she said to them, we need to test breast milk. The women need to know what their, their levels are, but you can't just send, you know, white guys in lab coats to go collect breast milk. The people are not going to accept that. 
you need to train Mohawk women to do this kind of work. And so that's what they did. And women were trained to go to the, the homes that were selected for the study and gather that breast milk. And what they found um, in some of those initial studies was that women who ate a lot of fish had higher levels of PCBs in their breast milk. And as women cut fish out of their diet over the years, um, those levels went down. And they did fingerprinting analysis as when they were just starting to figure out how to do this with PCBs and definitively found that the PCBs in the breast milk were the same as the fish, were the same as General Motors. So they were able to um, clearly outline how that chain had happened. And the public health community said, well, okay, there you go. We figured out that if you don't want to be exposed to PCBs and you don't want PCBs in your breast milk, then just don't eat the fish, uh, which the women were very unhappy about because they didn't feel like they should have to shoulder the burden of um, you know, altering their life and culture in order to be protected from someone else's mess. So the next slide down just um, shows some photos of Gudji Cook, who was really of a central character as part of this story and continues to do a lot of work in her community around um, birthing and health. So she started by, um, you know, she was a, an activist. She promoted traditional home birth as a form of resistance. She was traveling with the white roots of peach, which was a caravan going around the country, um, working to teach about native culture and get people excited about their home communities. In the 70s, she trained as a medical midwife, um, and she worked in Minneapolis and started the Women's Dance Project there and then brought that back to her home community of Akwazasne and then started the Mother's Milk Project, which was how she um, got the funding and the support to do some of these initial breast milk tests. And then from there, when um, the community of Akwazasne then partnered with the State University of New York or SUNY Albany, um, they started the first environment research project, and that's why I've got on the slide here that painting by Sherelle Tahi of um, the, the woman with the earth inside of her. So the idea of the first environment research project was the first environment that um, every human is exposed to is within the womb. And so how do we protect that and make that to be a, a safe place to develop and be nurtured? So the next slide down, um, the community-based participatory research that happened here, um, they decided after those initial breast milk tests to expand the research and look at how other people in the community were being impacted by PCBs, to what extent was it in folks' blood, um, how was it affecting thyroid and cognitive ability and some of these other types of tests. And so the State University of New York applied for a Superfund Basic Research Project grant and then partnered with the Akwazasne Task Force on the Environment, which is a grassroots organization in Akwazasne that works to represent the environment of the whole community. So as I mentioned previously, you have all of these different governments in Akwazasne that have their own environment divisions and environment programs. And so ATFE was developed as a way of bringing people together from all of those different constituencies to try to represent the entire community and their needs there. And so people from all of these organizations came together to really develop this project. And the next slide down, the Good Mind Research Protocol, um, rather than assuming that just because a researcher has gotten clearance from their university IRB, that that means that the, the report is gonna be healthy for the community, um, what they did at Akwazasne, the Akwazasne Task Force on the Environment Research Advisory Council, came up with the Good Mind Research Protocol, which is basically the community's IRB. And so any researchers that wanted to conduct future studies in Akwazasne had to apply to this research board in addition to their university's IRB. And they based this Good Mind Research Protocol on the principles that are part of um, the whole great law that um, people have developed the Confederacy around. Um, that, that Mohawks are part of. And so the three main principles are skana or peace, um, galiwia or ganigalio, which is the good word, the good mind, and gasostansala, which is strength. So the idea that if you have peace between all of the parties engaging in this research, then you have respect. Um, so both the scientists are going to respect the community's wishes, they're gonna respect the wealth of knowledge held by that community and how that can be applied. Um, and the community in turn will show respect to the scientists that they're collaborating with. Um, 
the good mind portion, if you good mind, you have equity. And so the notion of you know, don't expect the community to volunteer all their time while your research assistants are getting paid. You know, how can you take some of that grant money that's coming in for this research and funnel it toward the community? And so SUNY Albany worked to host events in the community and buy, you know, have their things catered locally to buy things from the community to make sure some of that research money um, was being spent there. And then the last principle, the Gasostanzla or strength, the notion was how can this project empower both sides? And so all of the articles that came out of this collaborative research included authors that were from SUNY Albany as well as from Akwesasne, representing the First Environment Research Project and the Akwesasne Task Force on the Environment um, as a way of empowering both sides with the production of this knowledge. So the next slide down, what they found, you know, to summarize 50-something papers that have been published out of this research, um, what they found in collaborating between SUNY Albany and Akwesasne was that People who had higher levels of PCBs in their blood were more likely to develop diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes specifically, heart disease, a decreased thyroid function, lower testosterone in males. Um, the timing of menarche or a girl's first period was affected. So girls that had higher levels of PCBs had an earlier first period. Um, uh, cognitive and memory um, performance was impacted by levels of PCBs. And then a more recent study found that um, a woman's ability to have a very consistent ovulatory cycle was impacted by the levels of PCBs in their blood. And some of those publications are still ongoing. So the, the next slide down, the way that these health studies were conducted, um, homes were chosen in the community through random sampling. Then there was a series of visits by a first environment research project employee that would see you know, who was living in that house, were they eligible for any of these different studies that were being conducted. Um, they would collect that data. Sometimes that was you know, blood or spit or uh, breast milk, and as well as um, some of the, the cognitive tests. That data was analyzed in Albany, and then each participant was sent a result letter. So it was considered important that each person know what their own numbers were um, as opposed to previous studies that it kind of left everybody guessing. So I got involved here. Um, I was a PhD student trying to figure out what to write my dissertation about. And I was visiting with Gudji one day uh, over tea and we were talking about the work that she had done, you know, as part of these studies. And she said, you know, somebody should go back and talk to people about what they thought about those studies, people in the community, you know, how looking back now, how do they think things maybe should have been differently and how can that be applied toward future research? So I um, went and I started snowball sampling. So basically I started with people that I knew um, and then asked them to recommend other folks to interview and kind of worked my way out from there. I did some targeted interviews with environmental specialists and health specialists. And essentially, um, you know, people were jealous, they're like, how did you get funding? You get to go visit. So I went and spent a lot of time visiting with people and conducting these interviews, um, trading labor in some cases. So I grew up on a little farm in upstate New York. And so I spent time, you know, butchering chickens and weeding and other kinds of work as a way of giving back and recognizing that when people were giving these interviews to me, that it was a form of labor as well. And I drank a lot of coffee and got served a lot of um, great cookies and food, everybody said. You know, you know how Indian hospitality works, so I didn't get to get hungry ever, um, but it was a great experience kind of visiting with a lot of these people. And I asked about people's participation in these health studies, you know, what that experience was like, what it was like getting their results back, you know, kind of their feedback on how they might be um, done differently in the future, um, but also changes in community food systems and other threats to community health. So I wanted to know what are some of the collateral impacts of having your food system so abruptly interrupted by contamination. So as part of this, I interviewed 63 Akwesaslonan, some people from Akwesasne, 32 of whom were personally involved in the studies as participants, six were First Environment Research Projects employees, um, and then also seven SUNY scientists, because I wanted to know what their experience was like as well. So for many of them, this was very different from their training that they had received. They were really kind of 
learning new methods as they were going when it came to having somebody else collect the, the data and having to negotiate with community members about the type of data that would be collected. Um, the next slide down, one of the things that I asked people about was fish consumption, and three quarters of the people I talked to replied that they had dramatically decreased or entirely ceased local fish consumption, um, many after the advisories that were issued, after it was discovered there were PCBs in the fish, there were these sort of blanket fish advisories that said, you know, anybody of childbearing age should avoid local fish or eat one fish meal a month. And many times, you know, that also meant that that the men in the families were um, not eating fish either if the, the women weren't cooking it or they thought, well, if it's not good enough for them, it's probably not good enough for me. Some people were noting changes in the fish that they were suspicious of and avoided them for that reason. Um, and then other people said, well, there's so much that's being lost by not eating fish. You know, there's words in the language that are being lost. There's opportunities to visit with family that are being lost. Um, and there were, you know, lots of opportunities to connect with, with elders, with, with younger people. Um, and so there was some concern around that. And then some folks felt that they had a cultural obligation to keep eating fish. So some of the, the men I talked to said, well, the creator put these fish here with agreement that we're supposed to respectfully harvest them and they will, you know, respectfully offer themselves up. And so if I stop fishing, those fish will stop offering themselves up and we'll lose that forever. And so there was some, some tension, some back and forth around you know, maintaining because of a, a cultural reason, even while being concerned about the potential PCB contamination. On the next slide down, one of the ideas that came out of this uh, research and the discussions that happened down the road was around environmental reproductive justice, or the idea of how do you ensure a community's reproductive capabilities are not inhibited by environmental contamination? So how do you make sure that people are able to have the children that they want um, and raise them in a safe, healthy, clean environment. Because um, you, as you noticed in some of the, the previous slides on the health impacts, that if testosterone is impacted, if ovulation is impacted, um, people were concerned about miscarriages. Um, how do we make sure that those environmental factors aren't impacting a woman's ability to conceive and carry to term a pregnancy? But then also, how do we think about the reproduction of knowledge and culture? So how is environmental contamination impacting the reproduction of knowledge and culturally informed tribal citizens? Because if you have to raise your kids in the same way that suburban white kids are raised, where they can't you know, go out on the land, they can't be eating the environment, um, how is that impacting the transmission of culture? And so this came to bear really, um, you see in the next slide, in a symposium that we held in 2011 in Hot Springs, South Dakota, and you see your very own Vi Wagihi there, who came down to represent um, ACAT in St. Lawrence Island. And there's a David Carpenter, who is a scientist from SUNY Albany, who you know started on the St. Lawrence River and then wound up in St. Lawrence Island, Alaska, continuing his PCB research. Um, and so people came together for the symposium from Amjanong, from the Lakota communities there, from Hawaii, from Alaska, um, to really think about this shared experience of having your culture and your reproductive capabilities um, impacted by environmental contamination and how we can think more clearly about that. So the, the next slide down, one of the things that I was talking to folks about that I was doing interviews as when we think about community-based participatory research, there's sort of three different phases. So first, there's the development of the project and you need input from community and scientists um, on how that project will be developed. There's the implementation part where you're recruiting participants, you're collecting your data, analyzing the data. And then there's the dissemination part. So um, how do you get that information back out to the, the scientific community, to the, the public community? Um, how are we making sure that the information gained is benefiting everyone. So one of the things that I was talking to participants about was what it was like to get those results back. What did that mean to them? How did that impact them? And some of the people I talked to, um, some were happy with their information. They were like, hey, at least I got something. Others didn't understand what it meant. They're like, well, I got this paper and it had all these numbers on it and I wasn't sure what it meant. And part of that was their expectations. You know, one woman said, well, am I gonna get cancer or not? Um, kind of not really understanding that nobody can predict that, sort of like, okay, they, all they can tell you 
is your levels of PCBs, but nobody can predict for you what your health outcomes will be because it's going to be different for every body. Um, the first environment research projects employees found the job to be tricky sometimes, but very rewarding. So some of the women that I talked to went on to, to work in labs, to work in other healthcare jobs, um, taking that experience that they had gained through being employees in this project into future progress. Um, when I talked to the scientists, they said that they learned a lot from having to negotiate with the community. Um, they thought in the end, most of them, you know, there was one curmudgeon who thought it was just inefficient. But most of the scientists I talked to said that they thought they got better results because they were collaborating directly with the community and um, people who participated who would not have otherwise. And there was some, and I can answer this in the questions too, people have more, some negotiating time and ownership of data was tricky. Um, each side had different ideas of how long things would take, how long it would take for results to be processed and sent back, um, what the life of that data would be afterwards. But one of the things people suggested, this is the next slide down, um, was that there was opportunity for more personalized report back and educating the whole family. So essentially um, what was done was that people were given letters of their individual results, and then there were big community meetings that nobody attended, um, and when I asked people about that, they said, well, you know, we don't want to go to a big community meeting and ask a question and look dumb, or that's just not how we um, get our information here. And so people suggested, well, can you meet with family groups? Can you do a series of smaller meetings? Um, thinking about targeting social bodies rather than just individual bodies with the report back letters. Um, and I won't, looks like I'm running low on time, so I won't spend too much time on these next couple of slides. But when I talk to people about, okay, so what are some of the current health concerns in the community? Is, is environmental contamination still the most um, salient concern? And it was sort of a thread that went through everything else, but one of the big concerns is around diabetes, and I'm sure this is something that people are facing in the communities that you're working with. Um, about a quarter of the community is diabetic, according to the Diabetes Center there. When I talked to people, some people felt that um, oh, it's 70% of the community. So people had a sense based on their personal experience that that was a, a much higher percentage because it was a very salient aspect in their life. And one of the things that came out of that in thinking about the social body um, is how do you not just target programming toward people who have been diagnosed with diabetes? And so now they in isolation are trying to change their diets when the rest of the family is still all eating together. Um, having meals together and you know cooking as a big extended family, but how do you work on a whole family in shifting their diet and collaborating more in that way? And some of this centering came out um, through a development of the centering healthcare notion. So centering pregnancy was a program that was developed there around this time, where women who were all pregnant or in the same kind of gestational period came together as a cohort to. Um, you know, check their stats and meet with doctors as a way of again, developing um, a social network for those women rather than approaching doctors individually. Um, also, this rites of passage ceremony was developed called Ojologo or Under the Husk as a way of kind of centering adolescents. So a lot of adolescents um, go through this transition in life feeling very alienated and engaging in unhealthy adult behaviors as part of trying to transition and so this uh, ceremony program was developed as a way of um, providing that cultural support and background for youth as they're moving up and becoming uh, responsible adults. And then Ganahio Yungaya Dohage is a kind of centering gardening, centering food program that was developed as a way of helping people that want to get back into farming and gardening by providing this social network and um, support by sharing equipment and sharing funds and sharing experience for people who uh, want to be able to produce food. So I'm going to, I'm low on time, so I'm going to skip past the kind of political bodies and some of the risk slides. Um, but to just kind of catch you up where things are now, this uh, map says GM site remediation status um, shows how the site was kind of split up. And there was some controversy among people of how do you determine the borders of a Superfund site? Right? How do you say this side is clean and this side is not? Um, so in some of the meetings in 1990, the EPA announced the different ways that they defined the site and its boundaries. And the director said, well, we define the site as the contaminated soils and lagoon sludges and 
you know, river sediments and the boundaries of the site are defined as the end of the contaminated medium. Um, but as many of you up in Alaska recognize with the atmospheric deposition of PCBs that originate in sites like this, um, you know, the borders of a site are something that I think are a little more complicated. If you think about all of the folks that are carrying around PCBs in their body right now from this site, um, figuring out the borders of a Superfund site are complicated. The next slide down, um, this is the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environment Division. And so one of the interesting things that came out of this extended process of trying to get this site cleaned up um, was that they developed a really strong environment division here that came up with its own standards for what the cleanup had to be for the sediment that had crossed over the line onto the reservation. So the, the ARARs, or applicable and relevant appropriate requirements from standards for piece of PCB cleanup at Akwesasne were 10 times more stringent than the state and federal standards. So they were able to take control of the cleanup process in that way. I'm going to skip past the kind of fish side. Um, the next slide that shows the grasshopper effect, which again shows how the PCBs are quite literally moving from St. Lawrence Island to St. Lawrence, Alaska, basically. Um, and then essentially what happened was um, in the fall of 1995, you see the site map there, the General Motors completed dredging of the PCB sediments. Um, they ended up having to put a cap over it because they couldn't get it quite clean enough. The dredged sediments were then shipped by rail to a hazardous waste disposal facility, um, which then I remember somebody in one of the public meetings saying, okay, whose res are they sending it to? Recognizing that if you're dredging things up and moving them from one site to another, it's just ending up in the backyard of another community of color, most likely. Um, in 2004 through two, or 2000 to 2004, um, they remediated some of those lagoons on the facility, um, dug out a lot of the sludge and contamination, um, kind of capped that industrial landfill there. And then um, 2008 happened. So the, the town upstream from General Motors had been working really hard to keep the factory open. They wanted it for jobs and they kept telling people like was us and like pipe down over there, quit demanding an expensive cleanup. We need the factory to stay open. Um, but in April, 2009, the government gave General Motors a $49.5 billion bailout. Um, that was in April and then in June, they still filed for bankruptcy. They spun off a holding company to handle all of the different properties. Um, 89 different sites that they had left in a contaminated way. And so some of that money was used um, in a trust to clean that up. So now the, we have the new General Motors, which is what we have today, but they're not related to the old General Motors. So all of this mess belongs to old General Motors and not new General Motors, which is doing just fine on the market now. Um, so yeah, to kind of skip ahead a little bit, the next site that people are focusing on is the Grass River. And now that there's a strong um, environment division there at the tribe, they're working really hard to um, keep an eye on how that's cleaned up and make sure it's done in the best way possible. And a new fish advisory was developed. Um, and this was done through you know, research and testing that the environment division did. Um, so that rather than saying, don't eat any of the fish, it's all bad, um, what they did was they tested a whole variety of fish and came up with this color-coded diagram and put that information in people's hands to say, okay, now you know you can make your own decisions and your own informed decisions, and we're going to trust you with that rather than just saying, no, don't eat anything. And so this new advisory um, has these different color codings and different maps about where people they're advised to get fish or not. And then um, the last slide I'll go through here, the Azajidawadu was a program that was developed out of settlement money from General Motors. So there was a natural resources damages assessment that was conducted um, where the, the argument was that it wasn't just the environment that was damaged, it was also um, the culture that was damaged by not being able to impact, interact with the environment over the years. And so some funding was put toward developing different apprenticeship programs where elders who were good at trapping or fishing or gardening were hired to work with apprentices to try to pass along some of that language and knowledge um, that had been interrupted as part of that process. So essentially, to, to close up here, some of the implications, applications of this work, 
Um, clearly, we need better policies and or direct action that will better protect the health, culture, and food sources of indigenous community from environmental contamination. We need to actually reduce risks rather than telling people to just avoid risks and leaving them in place. Um, the importance of community-based participatory research for developing programs that will be of direct use to communities. Um, the importance of considering the settler colonial context and the unique position of tribal nations in deciding uh, how we think about environmental justice and reproductive justice. And then also the importance of highlighting survivance. Um, you know, one of the questions that Nick sent me was about, you know, how do you not get down and glum in these kind of projects? And part of it is that people are working real hard to survive and maintain and still build beautiful things even when there are challenges. So um, there's a slide with the cover of the book. It's called The River is In Us, Fighting Toxics in a Mohawk Community. And I will cut it off there so that I can answer any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hoover. That is that is a wonderful presentation. Um, before we step into questions, um, I wanted to invite uh, Alaska Community Action on Toxics Environmental Health and Justice Program Director Vi Wahi. Um, to share her perspective on environmental issues and community-engaged research occurring in Alaska today, um, and maybe say a little bit about some of the parallels between contamination and these community health research projects on St. Lawrence, the St. Lawrence River, as as well as the St. Lawrence Island. Bye. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Um, my name is Vai Wari. I'm the daughter of the late John and Della Wari from Sivorok, also known as St. Lawrence Island. I'm a Yupik mother and grandmother. And um, it's an honor to um, have this call with Dr. Hoover. I first met her at the um, Environmental Reproductive Health Symposium and Retreat, she mentioned in July 2011 um, at, at the Hot Springs, South Dakota, um, near the homelands of the Lakota Sioux, and I'd like to acknowledge that here in Anchorage, uh, where our office is located, where I live and work on our um, Protecting Future Generations to Sivokak um, community-based project with our leadership on, um, uh, on our island, um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, um, uh, the, the first people that live on this these lands are the Dina Aina at the Baskins, uh, who lived here long before uh, the Europeans came. And um, it's so important that we acknowledge the first people on whose lands we are. Um, there are so many simil similar sim parallels, as Dr. Hooper was talking. Um, on our island, Sivoka, uh, we're located in the northern Bering Sea, where um, during the Cold War, the Air Force came and established two Air Force bases on each end of our island. Our island is the same size as Puerto Rico. We have two communities uh, left. Um, Savonga has about 800 people and Gamble about 700. At one time, there used to be 10,000 of us in 32 communities. And some of our elders estimate that we had even up to 20,000. Um, and because of concerns from a former health aide, Annie Aloha, um, this project began because Annie was one of the families that had been displaced from Northeast Cape, one of the formerly used defense sites. Uh, she started noticing a lot of cancers and low birth weight babies and miscarriages in our families that lived, worked, and camped there. Uh, we had a, um, a community of about 130 people that lived, worked, uh, um, during the, uh, when the base was open, but also uh, it was a very important uh, hunting and fishing food gathering location for our families on the island. Um, we do, my people have four to 10 times higher PCBs than the average American in the lower 48 because of the uh, abandoned military base. Uh, with our community-based uh, citizen science project, 
um, due to concerns that Annie raised, um, we have been supported from a federal agency, National Institute of Environmental Health Science on this CBPR project. Uh, they have supported us since 2000. Uh, nobody has done as much as we have. Um, looking at um, military contamination, but also the persistent organic pollutants that arrive in the Arctic through air and ocean currents, which Dr. Hoover mentioned, where we're, our people in the Arctic are being contaminated without our consent from these POPs. As you heard from her, these um, toxic chemicals biomagnify and bioaccumulate. Uh, they build up in the uh, marine mammals, which are important foods for my people. The bullhead whale, walrus, and seals have such high levels of um, PCBs up to 421 parts per billion. Uh, this is a very big uh, injustice. This is a burden our people did not create. Uh, anytime a chemical is manufactured, anytime it's released, it's spilled, it's applied, it up, ends up here in the Arctic. And uh, we are being contaminated without our consent. Um, we have so many similar health disparities we're seeing. In my community now, we have a cancer crisis. It's not a matter of if we'll get cancer, but when. And um, we're seeing not only cancers, but uh, our reproductive health illnesses. Annie noticed like uh, low birth weight babies, miscarriages. Um, as a cancer survivor myself, um, you know, it's, it's people in my generation who lived um, as children at Northeast Cape are now having um, some of the most uh, cancers that we're seeing in our communities. Um, the lived life exposures from um, cradle to, to um, death, you know, are not really looked at. Um, but it's so important that we are at the forefront when um, decisions are being made for us. Uh, a, a lot of times they're miles and miles away. It's so important that as first people and people of color, as you heard from Dr. Um, Hoover, who are you know, some of the most exposed, uh, not only in um, the United States, United States, but throughout the globe. And um, it's so important that um, we take our own um, uh, research, do our own research. We have our own experts um, in our communities who saw our, our lands and waters before the military came. Um, with the POPs, we can't see them, we can't taste them, uh, but we now know that they are ending up in our the, uh, marine mammals at levels we should not be eating them for excess cancer risk. But it's so important to say that my people still feel the benefits outweigh the risk. Mm -hmm. um, as you heard from, um, um, Dr. Hoover, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's um, so important that we continue our way of life, uh, not only of our, our own knowledge and culture, uh, but um, we need to educate our uh, mothers and, and um, our communities and tribal leadership, and um, also, um, work to strengthen these chemical and environmental laws that are very outdated and broken. Um, the legal standards you heard about at the Ren Reynolds Metals, you know, they are not protective of communities of, like ours that live off the land and ocean. And um, <clears throat> so um, it, it, it was an honor to meet uh, um, Dr. Hoover and others that she mentioned, Dr. David Carpenter, who now works with us, is world-renowned and expert on PCBs and, and health. And uh, I just, I guess I'll stop there. It's important that we hear from um, experts like Dr. Hoover, and it's 
I'm so impressed that she's um, now teaching and is a, a professor at Brown University. And, um, you know, it, it, we have to take it upon ourselves, not only of what's happening, share our stories, but the larger community, the academia, um, other researchers and state and federal agencies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vi. Um, yeah, you've, you've both shared so much, um, but I sense the conversation is far from over uh, on these topics. Um, I also, perhaps a, a new book, The Ocean is in us. Uh, <laughs> but, um, Dr. Hoover, um, yeah, you did a great job of incorporating so many of my questions into your presentation. Um, now, yeah, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite questions or comments from participants. So um, if, if anyone has a question, um, please, yeah, feel free to press star two to unmute your line and state your name, your affiliation, and um, when you're finished, remember to hit star two again um, to, to mute your line again. And um, yeah, if anyone in Alaska um, has a question, maybe we'll just give preference there first and then, and then move out. This is Fai. I have a question for uh, Elizabeth. What What do we do mm -hmm. when science? What What do we do when science is not enough? Um, we're seeing such so many health disparities in our people. Um, this, you know, we have to stand behind our scientists. This is sound data. Uh, however, mm -hmm. you know, our people are dying not only of um, cancers, but we we have. Uh, two times more birth defects than the lower 48. Mm. Our, our Alaska Native infants have even two times more than non-natives in our state. So um, I, I wanted to ask you that question. What do we do when science is not enough? Um, I mean, I think this is where some of these different community-based projects have come in to try to um, provide in some cases alternate sources of food or workshops on you know ways of, of butchering these animals. I know you have gone to international forums by to try to um, bring to the international stage because this is the tricky part too when some of these contaminants are international, right? So it's one thing to be able to um, try to shame a local corporation that is directly polluting the neighbors and Honestly, I think more work needs to be done in that area of, you know, who is the the general manager of these companies, these places, you know, who nobody ever gets pointed at as being responsible for making some of these messes. Um, now, in your case, it's a lot harder when it's the military. You know, how do you make the military feel bad about messes they've made? I'm not even sure. Um, but I think you've done important work by and going to the the international stage and fighting on that level. Um, so I think it needs to, it has to span the scope from, you know, trying to address the entire world on these issues to, you know, building community support for um, how do we revive some of these traditional health practices and traditional medicines and um, ways of trying to get better access to our healthy traditional foods in that way. Thank you. Yeah, we still have time, I think, for if anyone else wants to unmute their line to ask a question. Hi, this Hi. is Jan Burke from Alaska Community Action on Toxics. And I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Hoover. It's, it's great to hear your voice again and, and so appreciate all of the work that you do. And my question is, um, I'm interested in understanding the whether the community and the scientists that conducted this very important community-based research received criticism from industry or state or federal agencies that attempted to discredit this really significant work. Mm -hmm. And thank you again so much. Yeah, I didn't catch the name. Was that Pam? Oh, she must be muted again. I, um, I think so. <laughs> Yes, Elizabeth. Hi, this is Pam. <laughs> Hi, nice to hear you again. I thought that sounded like your voice. Um, 
in this case, where they, where they received criticism, there was a big effort to be able to demonstrate that these studies were carried out um, very, you know, using the scientific method at every possible turn. And so, you know, the way that the homes were randomly selected using you know, computer programs, the women who were the field workers who went out were um, trained and retrained on these protocols as a way of trying to make sure that everything was very consistent um, because there was that concern. Um, and, you know, one of the, the folks I talked to said, you know, it would be really great. More people are getting science educations in our community um, to be able to just do our own studies someday. And her concern, though, was, will people believe us? Will they think we're too biased if it's all people within the community doing this scientific research? Um, so that has been a concern. But in the case of these studies here, um, from what I could tell, there wasn't that criticism because people worked so hard to try to um, show that this was just as rigorous as sending out a pack of grad students. Hi, this is Patty from um, Alaska as well. I am very curious to hear more about how you were able to um, get your 10 times more stringent standard uh, for, I don't know if it was for cleanup or um, whatever standard was applied. How did you get, or how did they, the community get um, the other uh, jurisdictions to accept that standard set by the community as the one that was going to be used? So that standard only applies to land on the reservation. So they would have liked to have applied that to the whole cleanup process. Um, but the way, and I don't know how it works in Alaska, everything is different there, but in the states, um, if a tribe is federally recognized and it has its own environment division, basically its own tribal EPA, um, they get treatment as state and they can create their own ARARs, so the applicable, relevant, appropriate requirements, which means that tribes can set environmental standards on their land that they have jurisdiction over that is different from um, what the federal or state standards are. So for example, in other communities, um, in uh, the Wisconsin Oneida, for example, have set it so that there is a larger riparian buffer around streams. So if you're farming, you can't get as close to the stream um, if you're farming on the Oneida land as you can in other places in Wisconsin. So in this case, all, any contamination that had leached over the line from New York State into Akwesasne, um, that's where the standards set by the tribe had to be applied as far as that cleanup. So two inches away, that was considered New York State, um, then the regular standards applied. May Thank I you. ask a Hi. question? <clears throat> Hi. Um, I'm Katie Singer in New Mexico. Thank you very much. Can you say the difference between PCBs and is it PFOAs, um, the, the Teflon coating that mm -hmm. is now getting into waterways and land from everything from solar panels to Teflon stuff? It, well, they have Teflon on solar panels. Uh -huh. um, I am not a scientist. I'm not a chemist. Um, but basically, they're just totally different categories of chemicals. So PCBs are polychlorinated biphenyls um, versus PFAS, PFOAs, are um, perfluoric acid, um, C8. So it just has a different base. It's a different chemical entirely. It's another persistent pollutant. I mean, that's what they have in common. It's another one that once it gets into the environment, it really sticks around for a long time and is hard to clean up. Thank you. Hi, this is Jessica Winstaffer with Chickaloo Native Village in Alaska. I am mm -hmm. uh, really appreciative of the presentation and, and discussion today. Is there any toolkit or guidelines that you could recommend for developing one's own community participatory research um, it's on a very different topic, but um, obviously the same uh, goals would be met. And is there any guideline that we could use? 
Any toolkit. Um, well, the Good Mind Research Protocol that Equizensity developed, I think it's a good base for a community to have its own, you know, research advisory council to have its own standards to say, okay, here's what we will accept for people researching here. Um, so that is available online, or if you can't find it, you're welcome to email me, and I can um, email you a PDF of that. And then beyond that, because really that um, set the tone and standard for how their research was built out, and that Good Mind Research Protocol was based off of the the Great Law, and so this was a cultural um, entity that then provided that guidance for how that um, respect and reciprocity was going to look at. Um, there's the, the little diagram that I don't know if you got to see the slides that were online. That sort of, you know, just as a, a rudimentary um, elements of CBPR of thinking about. I'm trying to scroll back to where that little diagram was, which page it was on. Um, that shows kind of the three elements. So in thinking about setting up a project, how are you getting? Okay, so it's on page 17. You know, in developing the project, how is the community setting the priorities, making sure the project has community relevance, but also that it has scientific value. So getting back to Pam's question about will the scientific community accept the results of this project, um, that that's really the, the role of the scientists in the development portion of the project, saying, okay, if it's going to meet funder priorities, if it's going to be accepted by the legal community, by the scientific community, here are the standards that we need to follow. Um, and then thinking about implementation. So how you know, the community's role in ensuring that the, the instruments are accessible. So you know, if there's a survey, are people going to understand what people are saying? Is there you know, good recruitment? Are we reaching out to the necessary subset of the community? Of the, the community's strength is able to identify that. Um, and then again, on the, the researcher side, making sure that there's scientific rigor, saying, okay, are we getting a representative sample if we're trying to say this is an issue plaguing the whole community? And then what I was talking about, especially the dissemination portion. So how do you make sure that the results that are coming out of all of this research are published in a way that get out to the scientific community, but also especially are brought back to the, the home community and making sure that people are seeing their own results and knowing if they should be altering their behavior or their lifestyle in any way. So there's a lot of reading out there in general um, about CBPR. If you go into to PubMed or you know, Google Scholar, there's a whole lot about kind of what the research that people have done on building a good CBPR project. But I think that's a good framework to, to start with and thinking about um, if you're having these entities coming together, the scientists or medical community and the, the broader indigenous community you're working with, and recognizing that increasingly those are not mutually exclusive categories. So we now have indigenous people who are scientists. Um, and so, but thinking about how is the, the community side, the grassroots side, the traditional environmental knowledge side represented, but also um, the kind of hard science, scientific community. Um, skills being contributed in a way that's useful. Well, uh, it, it looks like we have we have come to the end of our, our hour. Um, I really want to thank all of you for participating today. Um, it's it's really been a, a great call. Um, I'll, I'll be sending out an email within the, within the next day or two with a recording um, of the call and make that available on our website. Um, and our next call will be on February 26th, uh, when we'll be joined by attorney and author Robert Bowat to talk about his recent book, Exposure, um, and his ongoing work to compa combat uh, PFAS contamination. So finally, um, yeah, I hope you will consider making a donation to Alaska Community Action on Toxics to support our monthly CHE Alaska calls. Your contribution in whatever amount is right for you will help provide the support we need to continue bringing you these calls each and every month. You can give online at www.akaction.org. And lastly, if you have any additional questions or comments, please feel free to contact us by calling us here at 222-7714, and the Alaska area code is 907, uh, so for those of you calling from outside the state.
um, call 907-222-7714. And thanks again to everyone, uh, and have a wonderful day. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Hoover. It really was a, a pleasure.